Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 John to chapter 5. That's where we're going to start this evening. We're probably only going to cover the uh, first five verses of uh, this chapter. Uh, so we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5. Uh, we're going to read the first five verses. We'll start with Naomi. We'll do two verses each. We'll do Naomi, Henry, and either Bill or Tammy, depending on uh, which one... Uh, wishes to read, but uh, two verses each. John, 1 John 5, verses 1 to 5. Let's remember to speak up. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of the God, and we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is a victory, and it has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. All right, so remember, let's put into our context. Who is John trying to combat here? What belief system? The Gnostics. So... We are, we are going to be uh, trying to frame this into the Gnostic system because when we try to frame this into today's religious world, does this mean that everyone who professes Jesus is going to be born of God and be saved? And if not, how do we know it? Okay, so one way to be born of God following the plan of salvation, what would that involve? Well, first we believe who Christ is, and then we obey his gospel. Sure. I would, uh, uh, John sums that up in verse 4, faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Grace is what God does for us. Faith is what we do. We believe in what God has revealed. And so I'm thinking of Matthew 7. Uh, Tammy, you want to get Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Okay, so on its face, you come along this way. Matthew is saying one thing, John's saying something else. Who's right? And if we've missed who John's audience is, we'll miss what John's saying. Did the Gnostics believe that Jesus was the Christ? God the king. No they, no, they did not. They denied the deity of Jesus and the incarnation of Jesus, meaning the, that Jesus came in the flesh. We've already dealt with that uh, throughout this book. And so when we look at it through that lens, we don't have to worry about the faith-only people today because that's not who John's talking about. Matthew 7 would deal with faith only. Ephesians 2 deals with faith only. Galatians 3 deals with uh, how, to, how to combat faith only. And there are a whole bunch of other passages as well. But 1 John 5 verse 1 isn't talking about faith only. It's talking, it's trying to combat the Gnostics. And so he's coming along and saying, the Gnostics aren't born of God. Because they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. And uh, everyone 
who loves him, being Christ, who bear God, who begot, also loves him who are begotten of him. So in other words, they would love Jesus, and they would love those who are born of God. The Gnostics are almost like a secret society. You have to come and be with us or we don't love you. Or you're not in the in crowd. Our question is, why are those who believe that Jesus is the Christ be are begotten of God? Why is that? Oh, okay. You want to explain what those words are? Three different words? Um, well, they were born. Okay. The born of God was one. And uh, um, I didn't write down. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, beget, I think, in Hebrews. Okay. The one. So, so we have born of God, we have beget. And you said there were three. Do you have the third one? Yeah. Well, it kind of goes back to what you were just talking about. I was thinking. John 3 and 5 says that unless one is born in water and the spirit, he can't enter the, the kingdom of heaven. There's, there's a, a plan that God commanded us to follow. And, and then we follow that, and then we're born of God. Okay. So John is the same writer as, first John is written by the same author as John. So it's not a it's not, it shouldn't be surprising to us that he uses the same language of being born of God. And so whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, part of believing that Jesus is the anointed one, the Christ, is to believe what he taught. Because he taught that he was the Christ. He was the Son of God. He taught, I am the anointed one. I was sent from my Father. If you believe in me, you will have everlasting life. Well, Jesus taught us how to be born of the Father. We talked about in our Sunday study of John being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of water? Baptism. Yeah. Baptism is born of water and the Spirit. What does that mean? Born of the Spirit. Okay, we've talked about that even in 1 John. Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Christ. Again, we, we not mystical, not magical. Uh, Spirit is the one who revealed the word. And Titus 3 would say the Spirit is the one who renews our mind. The renewing of the Holy Spirit, the regeneration. Baptism. When someone is baptized, they're not the one doing the work. They're the one submitting in faith. Let no one think when they are baptized that they are remitting their sins. Or that the water, the physical water, is remitting their sins. Just being put into water doesn't automatically forgive someone's sins or everyone's sins will be forgiven when they go swimming. When you teach a child to swim you, what do you do? You dunk them in the water. Well, child, children don't have sins to be remitted of, but if you teach an adult to swim, you would teach probably very similar. And they do have sins to be remitted, but there's no faith there. The, the baptism is effective when someone has the faith in what God is doing. That's what makes baptism effective. God hasn't remitted our sins yet. And the way I know that is because Paul uses some very similar language. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Now we want to get 1 to 3 and Henry 4 and 5. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin shall still live in it? Do you not know that all of the, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That the justified Christ was risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of the life. Okay, here. Oh, sorry. Uh, for, oh, sorry. Finish that. Sorry. 55. Yeah. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay. So let's think about this for a sec. Did Jesus have to die in order for our sins to be remitted, according to Scripture? Bill is shaking his head. Yes, Jesus had to die. Scripture tells us that the, the, the blood of a righteous man, a completely righteous man, was the price for sin. Blood, the life is in the blood. The Old Testament makes that clear. Genesis 9 makes that clear. The life is in the blood. Christ offered his blood, which was his life, so that we might have newness of life. We might have spiritual life. That's why when Jesus says he is the bread of life, when he is the way, the truth, and the life, he is the resurrection and the life in the book of John, he is saying he is the provider of life. He provided physical life through creation. He provides spiritual life through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so Christ had to die. This question may be confusing, but we'll see if you see if you come around the way I think. When Christ was on this earth, before he went to the cross. Were our sins remitted yet? In the eyes of God. No, they weren't. Now, did God know that Jesus would accomplish it? Well, yes, we know that. Uh, but until the act actually happened, our sins were not remitted yet. God could remit sins. Jesus could remit sins. He did so here on this earth. That is not outside of God's power. But the payment for sin had not yet been paid. And the reason why I'm wanting to, for us to think this way, Jesus had to die. Our sins were not remitted until he died. But the proof that our sins were remitted is actually not in his death, but in his resurrection. Our sins were remitted by his death. But it's only his resurrection that is the provider of life. Christ, if Christ was dead today, he's not a provider of anything. He's just a regular man who died of a gruesome death, but he died the same way that you and I do in the fact that his spirit leaves the body. Why am I bringing this up? Because people want to say, that their sins are remitted before baptism. Baptism is compared to what in this passage of Romans 6? His death. Baptism is not, uh, is not compared to his resurrection. Baptism is compared to his death. When we go down into the water, are we spiritually alive or spiritually dead? We're spiritually dead because we still have sins. When Christ was buried, as far as he wasn't buried the same way we bury people, he's buried in a cave, but he's, he's buried in the earth. Was he dead or alive when he went and was buried by Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus? He was dead. He was not alive. So, Jesus died and was buried. He was dead. We are baptized. We are buried in water. We are dead. Three days later, when the women came to the tomb, was Jesus alive or dead? When the women came to the tomb, then he was alive. 
He went into the grave dead, but he rose from the dead. We go down into the water dead spiritually. What do we raise? What are, what are we raised? Spiritually what? Spiritually alive. We, the, the coming up out of the waters of baptism is compared to the resurrection. Now, what changed in the water? If we went down spiritually dead and come up spiritually alive, what changed in the water? Physically? Nothing. Physically nothing. So it can't be anything physical. What happened in the water? That's the point. In the water, when we go down in faith, God forgives our sins. Titus 3 says, the Spirit renews us and regenerates us. We are no longer spiritually dead in sin. We are raised to walk in newness of life. Christ died physically, was physically buried, and was physically raised. We die spiritually when we sin. We are buried in the likeness of Jesus' death in baptism. We are raised in the likeness of his resurrection. He was physically alive. We are spiritually alive. And so those who believe that Jesus is the Christ and is being begotten of God, that's because God, uh, uh, we are born again. Spiritually this time. Not this. A new life only can come from a new birth. We can't really have a new life. We have a new computer. It has none of the old parts in it. It's a new creation down here, new computer. Well, if we have a new life, a spiritual life, we had to be born again. And so we are raised from spiritual death. That's why those who believe that Jesus is the Christ are begotten again, because we're born again. We're doing exactly what Jesus said. God. God enables us to be born again. Let's go to Galatians 3. Uh, Bill, you want to get Galatians 3, verses uh, 26 to 29. Uh, to 29, yes. Uh, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to promise. Okay. Can't ask this of Naomi, it can't ask this of me. Because I don't, we don't have any children. Henry, you have you have a son. Why is Anthony your son? Because I begot him. Yes, because you begot him. You and Cherry begot him. And Bill had I don't know how many children you have, Bill. I'm sorry. You have how many? Three. Three. Why are they your children? Because. You're their father. You begot them. We are all sons of God. What does that imply? We're born of God. We're born of God. God began us by remitting our sins. God was our ultimate creator, yes. But we are all sons of God in this passage through faith in Christ Jesus. This is talking about a spiritual beginning. We are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
that faith leads us to baptism, as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're all equal in Christ. There is no lesser son of God, no greater son of God. We could be a Greek or a Jew. We could be a slave or a free man. We could be a man or a woman. We can all be one, united in Christ Jesus. Notice that we are not united in each other. We're not united in this world. We can be one in Christ Jesus. And if we are Christ's, then we're Abraham's seed. And that's, we've studied Galatians before. Paul is culminating his, his um, uh, talk here about the seed of promise. How the Jews thought that they were the seed of promise. It was Jesus that was the seed of promise. When God promised Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. It's through Christ. And we are Abraham's seed and heirs of God. If we are children, we are heirs. Family members are heirs of a, per of a person's will. Yes, we understand that, yes, people put in friends and, and acquaintances there. But usually when you think of a will, you think of heirs as being family. People who are not family aren't expecting any inheritance from someone else. Well, God is not giving out an inheritance to those who are not his children. And we cannot be his children if we do not have faith in Christ Jesus. We do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. Let's go back to 1 John 5 then. 1 John 5. Uh, the question to ask, what is the test to know if one loves the children of God? Remember, we've been talking about we have to, if we're abiding in God, we're loving our brethren. We cannot abide in God if we hate our brethren. So what is the test? That we know that we love the brethren. Well, verse 2, it says, Well, we love God and keep his commandments. Okay. Well, first thing is, we have to love God. Okay, so if we if we love the brethren. We automatically love God. We can't love our brethren without loving God. God is love. God is the one who taught us to love. I'm not talking about a romantic love. I'm talking about a self-sacrificing love for our brethren. But why is keeping his commandments, why would that prove that we love the children of God? Okay. He told us. He provided us the example of what it means to love our brethren. If we love God and keep his commandments, like we sang earlier, we know we love the children of God. Because part of God's commandments are to love the brethren. We don't have to wonder Am I loving the brethren? Are you keeping God's commandments? Are you doing the things that God, God didn't just say love your neighbor. He provided examples of what that looks like. He, he told us what loving our neighbor looks like. Helping the poor. Helping those who are disadvantaged. Helping our family. Training our family. Prepare, uh, um, providing for our family. Providing for our brethren. Growing with one another in, in worship and in edification and in fellowship. We love our brethren when we follow what God told us to. It's just that simple. Uh, Bill. As I said, it, it takes a certain amount of humbleness to, to understand that in a way. Just so that it, God loved us. Or we love him. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're all different. We have our different 
which you can see, those we live with God, we deal with God, but we love one another's souls. Mm -hmm. You know, because God loved us. So, so who are we to pick and choose who who we're going to love? Yeah. In our brethren. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some brethren that make it awfully hard to love them, but that doesn't mean we don't love them. Doesn't mean we lead to that we can't allow differences of of personality lead to hatred. If we have concern for our brethren, we will talk to them. We will try to iron out our differences. We will do exactly what God commanded. And if we don't do what God commanded, if someone's not doing what God commands, then they don't really love God. Are God's commands too onerous, too hard to follow? According to 1 John 5. Not burdensome. A lot of times people think being a Christian is such a hard thing to do. And being a Christian can be hard. Let's not, let's not come along and say it's just so easy being a Christian. There's hard things. But remember what we read in Psalms 119 on Sunday. Oh, how I love thy law. Being a Christian shouldn't be like getting kids to eat their vegetables. If we really love God... And we really love to do what God said. We're not going to find loving our, na our neighbor or our brethren that burdensome to us. We're not going to find trying to learn God's commandments, trusting him in faith, that onerous, that hard to do, that impossible. It is not impossible to be a Christian. Jesus said, yes, it can be hard, and there will be few who will be saved in comparison to the world. But it's not impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. How does one overcome the world? Be born of God through faith. Uh, we sometimes, if you want to know where faith is the victory that overcomes the world, it's coming right from here. Faith is the victory because, remember, we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We overcome the world by being born of God. And believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, who's next to read? Uh, it's Tammy. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith. Think about that for a second. We could give all our money to the poor. We could go to church every Sunday. We could, we could devote our lives to charity. And yet, all of those things, and it's still not possible to please God if we don't have faith. Because all of those things, yes, are good things, but we cannot earn our salvation. We must receive grace, which is only received through obedient faith. That's the only way we can receive grace. That's the only way we can please God. We cannot please God in sin. We just can't, no matter how hard we try. We cannot please God in sin. 
What must we believe according to Hebrews 11, verse 6? First of all, that he is, that he exists, and that he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. We must believe in God, and we must believe God. God has promised Christians a reward. If we will not trust in God, we cannot please him. And so we can overcome the world. We can overcome sin through faith. And he who overcomes the world believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is all intricately packed together. We're born of God if we believe that Jesus is the Christ. We know that we love the children of God if we love God and keep his commandments. We can overcome the world if we're born of God and we're born of God again when we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verses 1 and 5 just go right back together. The argument built, he, he, John presents his argument, builds it in the middle, restates his argument to verse 5. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And the Gnostics did not do that. They have not been born of God, and they have not overcome the world. Meaning that they cannot please God. I'm not ashamed to own.